So I'm going to turn over the table to, to Sheridan and the four panelists. Um, <clears throat> Don, Glenn, Steve, and Robin, I think, are all in here. I can. Yep, there they are. So uh, I'll leave the introductions, more formal introductions, to share. We've got a slightly truncated um, timing for the session now, but I think we'll still be able to have a pretty fulsome discussion. So I'd like to, uh, to introduce um, the four panelists up here. I have to my left, oh, thank you very much, Bill. I have to my left, I have the Glenn Nolan, the Vice President for Norant Resources. Um, Glenn has advised a number of exploration and mining companies on Aboriginal engagement strategies. He's provided information to Aboriginal communities on partnership, development, opportunities related to resource development. He's com committed to continuing the creation of greater dialogue between communities and the mineral industry. Um, Mr. Nolan was the president of the PDAC for a period of two years, partly during my, um, during my uh, time as a staff member there, and I was very pleased to work with him. Um, and Glenn was elected chief, as the, uh, chief of the Missinabe Cree First Nation in 2001 and served for three consecutive terms ending in August 2010. So uh, well, thank you for being here. <laughs> and next to him is, um, we have uh, Stephen Wolfenden, correct? Yep. And uh, he is with uh, I Am Gold Corporation as their Corporate Environmental Assessment and Approvals Manager. Uh, Stephen Wolfenden is the Manager of Environmental Assessments and Approvals. He is currently focused on advancing the permit permitting of the Cote Gold Project. Prior to joining I Am Gold, Steve worked with the Public Service um, of Canada. He was uh, at the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency managing the federal EA and Aboriginal consultation process for Detour Lake Gold Project. Uh, following that um, decision by the federal minister of the environment, Stephen assumed the role of lead manager at SIA for Cliffs Chromite Project in the Ring of Fire. Steve worked on very uh, other key files during his time with the agency and was noted for his contributions in streamlining the regulatory process required to plan and implement the upcoming Pan Am Games to be held in Toronto during the summer of 2015. Very interesting, Steve. Um, you can tell I'm just reading this for the first time. <laughs> Steve also spent many years working with the DFO, uh, Departments of fin Fisheries and Oceans. During that time, he led reviews and approvals of projects from numerous sectors, such as aggregate extraction, transportation, and large-scale municipal infrastructure, including as well as waterfront revitalization. So, welcome. Um, next door we have Don Bubar, President and CEO of Avalon Rare Minerals. Don is a geologist with over 35 years experience in mineral exploration in Canada. He's a graduate of Millgill University and Queen's University. Um, from 1984 to 94, he worked for Ore Resources Inc. as Exploration Manager and later VP Exploration. Since 95, Mr. Bubar has been President and CEO of Avalon Rare Minerals Inc. He has served as a director of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada for nine years and chair of its Aboriginal Affairs Committee um, from 20, uh, 2004 until 2013. He now serves on the board and the executive committee of the Northwest and Nunavut Chamber of Mines. So welcome, Don. And last but not least, we have Robin Luke Webster, president of Gold Eye Explorations Limited. I don't think we've met yet, so hello. Um, he's the, uh, he has been responsible for Goldeye's community relationships, relations program since late 2012 and has led Goldeye in its highly intensive and hands-on consultation efforts with Sandy Lake First Nation. Prior to working at Goldeye, Mr. Webster was Vice, P, uh, Vice President of Business Development at JVX Limited. He studied economics and politics at Trent, graduated with a BA in Global Studies, and as part of his degree, he attended the Arabic Language Institute at the American University in Cairo. Okay, so welcome everybody. The, um, uh, the, 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 the panel was intended to provide an operational perspective on some of the discussions that we were having leading up to, to now, and unfortunately, some of our time has been eaten up, but we still should have, be able to have a, a fulsome discussion on the, uh, on the couple of questions that, um, that we had identified for today's panel, and I'll just let you know, the audience know, that those questions are um, asking the panelists to, to provide a specific uh, experiential perspective on the challenges that their project may have faced with respect to Aboriginal engagement and how they overcame them. And that's something that, you know, typically I think people really want to hear about 
um, from, from, from practitioners. The second question is, um, uh, what was your experience in negotiating these relationships within your own organization um, or, or community? We don't have any, any First Nation representatives today, which we had hoped to um, uh, identify the same questions with relation to community. Well, we do. Sorry. Sorry about that. Glenn, we do have Aboriginal community representatives here, but you are here representing Avalon, so I don't know how you... Not at all. No. Sorry, Nora. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether you'll be able to bring those two perspectives together, but if you are able to and willing to do so, that would be very welcome. So I, I just thought I'd start off with, um, you know, given that we have, a, we have a bit of a time issue here, but let's just start off with maybe two or three minutes from each of you on giving us a context for where you're working and who you're working with so that before we go to answer the bigger questions to the panel, is that all right? Okay, then I'll just, we'll just start with you. Okay. Go ahead. Well, this is, uh, it's good, Steve, thanks. Uh, I'm with Norant Resources, and we're developing the Eagle's Nest Mine in the Ring of Fire. And uh, we've been there since 2007, uh, proven out uh, a very valuable nickel chromite, or nickel, sorry, nickel copper deposit. Uh, we do also have uh, chromite as a uh, secondary uh, uh, deposit, uh, but we're focused on our uh, massive sulfide. We are, um, we're the first to actually do so many things. Uh, first with our feasibility, first with uh, our uh, agreements up in the, with the communities, uh, first to have a, uh, um, our environmental assessment completed and submitted to the government. Uh, however, we are also uh, dealing with uh, issues around uh, uh, 15 First Nations that uh, we have to uh, consult with on a regular basis, and so that's the uh, that's where we are today. Sure, I'll go. Um, so, as we said, I'm working on a project called the Cote Gold Project. It's uh, a large, undeveloped uh, gold mining potential project. It's located uh, nicely between Timmins and Sudbury, so it's we have two very mining-friendly jurisdictions close to us, right on, and we're like just right off of Highway 144, so it's about halfway in between those two areas. Um, it's proposed to be, right now, we're planning a 60,000 ton per day gold mine, so that is equivalent to detour, around the same size detour or the Arctic, very large gold mining operation because it's a low-grade gold mine uh, open pit. Um, we're dealing with and working with a number of communities around uh, First Nation communities would include Metogamy First Nation, Flying Post First Nation. We sit, our project sits right on their traditional territory. Um, and then also peripherally a number of other WAB and Tribal Council communities. We've been fortunate to work with WAB and Tribal Council, who is the overarching organization representing several of those local communities. And they do help out a lot in coordinating the consultation uh, and working with us on the uh, agreements such as the IVA. Uh, we're also working with Métis Nation Ontario, and uh, we've been working closely with them to make sure that we have traditional knowledge, traditional land use studies in place. With respect to where the project is today, we are within weeks of submitting our final EA uh, and moving that forward to find our final minister's decision. Great. Don, go ahead. <laughs> So um, I've been um, doing Aboriginal community engagement for over 20 years now, actually going back to my days with uh, Ore Resources. Started in the Northwest Territories during the uh, diamond rush up there and uh, did everything wrong um, in terms of community engagement at that time. Uh, since then I've done uh, work in other parts of Canada, uh, mostly in Ontario and in Northwest Territories. And uh, recently I've been working in Nova Scotia, actually. Uh, we've got a new project down there which um, I'm finding an uh, absolutely delightful place to work because uh, Nova Scotia has an agreement uh, between the government of Nova Scotia and the Mi'kmaq Nation that defines a consultation protocol and gives you a really clear proponent's guide on exactly what you have to do to uh, exercise your, your duties there, work with the First Nations and find opportunities for collaboration and business partnerships. Uh, this would be uh, something that a lot of other provinces could look at as a model, uh, Mr. Hughes, in terms of uh, <laughs> how, to, uh, how it can be done, how one province is, has uh, actually done a terrific job. Uh, it's a story that needs to be better communicated. 
But um, most of my recent experience has been in the Northwest Territories uh, with an advanced project, we, a rare earth project we call Netalacho that we've taken all the way from early stage exploration right through feasibility. And um, uh, what I'll do is uh, later on is elaborate a little bit of our, on our experience with that project specifically. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first, I have to say, excuse me if my uh, voice goes, we've had uh, six people down from Sandy Lake for the Canadian Aboriginal Minerals Association Conference. I've been talking for three days straight. <laughs> and uh, last night, we were all busy uh, booing the Toronto Maple Leafs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the voice is taking a beating. Um, I'm with Gold Eye Explorations Limited, and uh, we are the earliest of early stage junior companies. Um, we have a fantastic project we call Weebiji. Um, it's near Sandy Lake, Ontario, the town, Sandy Lake First Nation, uh, the First Nation, the community, the reserve. Our project is part of the community. Yeah. Um, our claims. Uh, border the reserve. So it's, it's a very unique case. Uh, we staked uh, our project in 1986 and we started uh, drilling in 2014. So there's a very interesting story here. Uh, my involvement uh, was uh, my father founded the company. So these claims were staked when I was four years old. Uh, I've watched it my entire life. Uh, about two years ago, uh, we had to figure out how to make this work because other the company had other projects which had uh, uh, been sold. And we now had a situation where we had no choice. Uh, Blaine had spent many years building good relationships, and my job was to turn those relationships into an agreement and an active project. We're getting there, so uh, uh, not easy. But uh, that is uh, that is our story, and uh, really, ha had I known this opportunity would have been here, it would have been so nice to have the guys from Sandy Lake uh, down here today. But we had just booked the tickets for for uh, uh, their return from Cama, so uh, I'm sure they would have loved to uh, be here. But, but we're an early stage exploration project that's trying something new. We have, we have no knowledge how to do this. Uh, we're just uh, really at the very grassroots uh, trying to figure something out. So uh, these guys are the experts, and uh, uh, I'm presenting a little case study of uh, some doing it uh, maybe a little bit differently. Great, thank you. Thank you all for helping us to understand the kinds of projects that you're involved in. So we have essentially three Ontario projects and one uh, Northwest Territories project as well as some some information from Nova Scotia. Um, the uh, the question, let's move on then to what were the challenges that your pro your project faced with respect to engagement and how did you overcome them? Would you, would you like to self-select in terms of an order, or should we just continue in the same format? I'll go for it. Okay, great. Well, I think that the, uh, we, we've heard about some of the challenges that are out there, and capacity is one of them. Uh, many of the communities have never had direct contact with exploration companies or activities around their territories that have been occurring for many, many years, but no one has actually come into the community to talk about it. Ironically, a lot of the community members have had a, a relationship as uh, line cutters or staking claims in the past, but that hasn't, been, hasn't translated in any substantive way to knowledge within the whole community. So our challenge is to identify the community leadership and then bring our project to them to uh, inform them of what it is that we're going to be doing. You know, we were beside another company that is now gone that was proposing to put in a, uh, a uh, open pit operation, and we were confused with them con consistently. They talked about, you know, the chromite resource and how it's going to contaminate. It's, uh, they brought up Aaron Brockovich. They, you know, they talked about all those things that were related to chromite. Our project is not chromite, but we were lumped into them. Also, because this other company had lots of money and lots of uh, media clout, 
we were cons we were told that we had to do the same thing they did. So that was another challenge that we had. But the other challenge that we have in relationship with the communities is the government and the government's inability. And no disrespect to individuals here in the room, without mentioning names, <laughs> is their inability to make a decision on permitting. Uh, we have uh, an outstanding exploration permit that needs to be done, and we don't know why it hasn't uh, hasn't occurred because of um, we think it's just the timing and I actually brought this up to the minister I said your timing as a government is very different from our timing as a junior company how can you how can we work together to reconcile that with the communities so the last challenge that we have is with advisors to the communities and I'll give you an example a bill came out to the community and we were asked about this bill as a legal advisor, $400,000. Nothing, no agreements, nothing to the communities yet from the company, but they get a bill for $400,000. So we're going, well, we can't help you with that because we don't even have, we haven't even sat down and had discussions with you. But they wanted us to, to somehow help them with this, this legal bill. So the outside advisors and uh, Michael mentioned, these are not project advisors, these are lifelong advisors. They want this project to be stretched out, in my view, because I was a chief once and we never allowed them into our community, because it doesn't have an end game and it doesn't benefit the community. It benefits the, either the lawyers or the advisors. So those are the challenges. We're still working on, we haven't uh, solved all the problems because this is, this is a relationship like a marriage. You've got to continue to work through those difficult uh, times, but you also have to build that relationship to build the trust. And that's probably the most critical thing with our relationship is to continue to develop that trust between us and the communities. Sure. I'll go, I'll go next. Uh, I, I certainly you would echo the sentiments about building trust and, and, and needing time to to build a foundation on a good relationship with the communities. And so for our project, one of the challenges early on was uh, when I first took over the role at I'm Gold, Gold was at, I think, 1600. Uh, it's not anywhere near that now. And so the timelines that the company had for development was get the permit done and this project in the ground now. Um, and you know, 18 months. We want to be building. It's like, whoa, that's really fast. And I can tell you from my time at government, everybody used to come in our door at government, tell us we want our project built in 18 months, and we want to be mining. And we used to always kind of have a little chuckle to ourselves outside of the meetings with proponents. But so one of the challenges we definitely had early on was. You know, getting in communities, getting that, trying to have that good relationship that does take time, but meeting those timelines. The corporate uh, guys at the head office are saying, you know, we want to have this done, and we want to have the construction starting at this day, um, and aligning those is not easy. Also, with a company like I Am Gold, one of our internal challenges has been we operate. We do have operations in Canada. There are parts in Quebec that have not had a lot of interaction with First Nations or Aboriginal communities. Um, and then we have operations in South America and Africa. So these are not issues that this company has had a lot of experience with. And so we've been doing our own education inside with our executive team or board, trying to explain to them, we have to do this, we have to set this relationship. These are the things we may expect, you know, the hiccups that may occur along the way. Um, so it's you know, and in, the other thing too is an education inside is it takes a lot of resources. I think people are quite surprised with how much time, money you require to spend to get those relationships into a place that are productive. Um, and so it's it's just I think surprises a lot of people the amount of effort. I think some of your past neighbors underestimated that effort that was required and paid some price uh, for that. Um, and so that's something you have to think about is it's going to take a lot of effort. Permitting, you know, the actual getting the permits is a lot of effort, but getting those relationships and that consultation done is probably costs as much and takes as much effort. So um, uh, the main challenge that we faced basically was um, the complexity of the landscape there in terms of the, the number of Aboriginal groups that we had to engage with 
who had asserted rights to that area. And uh, it's, it's so complicated, I thought I would show you a couple of slides because you won't be able to remember all this uh, information. If you want to pull up the uh, second slide, I'll, I'll uh, show you the numbers and who the different parties are and give you a little bit of perspective. Because I think, as most of you know, um, I'm not a rookie at uh, Aboriginal community engagement. I've been doing it a long time. So when we started the Northwest Territories in 2005, I, I went in there with my eyes wide open in terms of best practice and what one needs to do to um, uh, do it right in terms of community engagement and engaging uh, um, and, and following a process that will ultimately lead to uh, uh, agreements and collaboration on project development. But uh, like I say, if there's a more complicated place in Canada than the Akecho Territory in, in Northwest Territories, I haven't seen it. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, presentations in my years at PDAC. Len and I put together lots of sessions at the convention over the year. We heard lots of case histories. I've never seen one quite like this. Well, um, that's the slide here. So <clears throat> now we had uh, seven different uh, Aboriginal groups to uh, deal with in the, uh, in the area of the Nechalacho project. Um, they fall into three basic categories. The Akecho territory is an unsettled land claim that involves uh, a number of First Nations. The three that assert traditional use of the land are the Alanized Dene First Nation, Litzelke Dene, First Nation at Dino Quang, First Nation at Forced Resolution. And while they're negotiating a, um, a land claim together, um, they don't agree on who has uh, uh, traditional ter uh, rights to the land that we're working on there at all, actually. And our model was to uh, get them to work collaborative, uh, collaboratively in a partnership arrangement. And um, we have yet to make that work, actually, although we, everyone's interested in being in some form of partnership. Then on top of that, um, the Cleacho have a subtle land claim that covers our area, actually. Because the infrastructure for the project will go south of Great Slave Lake uh, through Haight River, we have to deal with the Katladechi uh, First Nation. And then there are two uh, Métis groups um, in the Northwest Territories, one south of Great Slave Lake called the Northwest Territory Métis Nation. They actually have a subtle land claim with the uh, federal government. And the North Great Slave Lake, there's the North Slave Métis Alliance, and um, they don't have a, an agreement with the government, although they assert that they should, and they're working real hard to, uh, to negotiate one. And, of course, they don't agree with the Northwest Territory Métis Nation on who has, uh, who has rights there. So um, that's the landscape that we're working with. And then I'll show you a map in terms of how this kind of looks on a map. I use this a lot because... Um, you can see at a glance that it's pretty complicated in terms of uh, who has uh, what interests in what land relative to the project. So you see the project down there close to uh, Yellowknife with the cross hammers on the shore of, uh, uh, close to the shore of Great Slave Lake. It falls within the, um, the Clichos land claim area, which overlaps with the uh, Akecho and an area that the YKDFN, the Yellowknives, assert as their traditional territory. They call it the uh, Chief Dragies Territory. <clears throat> the Clicho have um, harvesting rights within that area, but it's limited to that. Um, so they actually are pretty good. They, they've they told us all along that um, we should work out a, an accommodation agreement with the Yellowknives and the other Akecho First Nations, and then we'll work with them later. Then um, uh, there's also the sort of treaty aspect of this too. So overlapped, uh, overlying all this is the fact that south of Great Slave Lake, uh, many of the communities there signed uh, Treaty 8. And then north of Great Slave Lake, some of the communities there signed Treaty 11. So some have treaty rights, some don't. And that's never been clear, and that's why I think that uh, land claim in the Akecho is still unresolved. And, because the government has a different view than the First Nations on uh, who's a signatory to the, to the treaty and who isn't. <clears throat> and then um, you see the area that's covered by the Northwest Territory Métis Nation land claim outlined by the dotted line. It actually goes north of Great Slave Lake, so therefore they, um, they can claim um, legitimately that they have uh, some rights to that land too that need to be accommodated in an agreement. And then you got Hay River down at the bottom there with the Catladechi uh, waiting to participate in whatever infrastructure we, uh, we put there. So 
Uh, we did manage to work through it, actually, and figure out who's uh, interested in what, but uh, there's still a few things we'd have to finalize before we get it all sorted out at the end of the day. So in an area like this, you've got to be patient and, and um, spend quite a bit of time uh, figure out that landscape so you know how to uh, work with the different parties and know how they relate to each other before you're ultimately going to find a way to accommodate everyone's interests. Next off. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, we're very lucky uh, in uh, one regard uh, that we ha uh, are in discussions with one group. Uh, and uh, when, when I look at that and look at the junior exploration angle, I think that's, that gets in for an early stage exploration company into a, uh, an unwinnable challenge. Um, we're so close to Sandy Lake First Nation where we're, we're dealing with Sandy Lake uh, alone. There's another uh, fact which, which uh, um, one of the people in the community that's most interested in mineral development and has the most knowledge is, is part of the trap line where we're working. So there's not even those two. We really have one partner and and that's uh, we're very uh, lucky uh, in that regards here's uh, some of the challenges um, so cut me off anytime Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so so we talk about the challenges but uh, they're not negative there's something really amazing is happening and and the challenges are almost insurmountable absolutely they're almost they're very difficult uh, uh, but they can there's, we can do it. And for people who, who see the changing landscape and the opportunity, there's really something amazing. So the, what we try to do with Sandy Lake, we call it uh, walking the path together. And uh, I have to give credit here. Uh, the person who came up with that was not me. It was Bernie Hughes. So we made the made T-shirts the when uh, Sandy Lake came down for uh, uh, PDAC, and we gave a talk. And... and uh, um, uh, now, now, it's it's a, really encapsulates what we're doing, uh, but there are a lot of challenges to walking the path together. Uh, two, which I'll talk about briefly, no mining culture. Um, Sandy Lake, it's a flying community, so at Cama we saw a lot of uh, varied groups, and uh, um, uh, you know some who have been in uh, their communities have been involved with my, uh, mining for for ages. Um, Sandy Lake's 227 kilometers north of Red Lake. Uh, the kids don't know anything about mining. Nothing. Zero. And there's the odd kid who comes up and stuns you with some amazing question about mining. How did you know that? But in general, there's very little knowledge about mining. The middle generation knows, uh, adults know a little bit. Um, some of them have uh, uh, a uh, maybe done line cutting or, or worked in Red Lake, um, and the elders the elders have a bit more knowledge, but it's they have negative experiences. Um, so there's the Barrens River mine 30 kilometers away from Sandy Lake, which uh, was shut down just a bit. It walked away. It's still there. Uh, the government's done a bit of a cleanup, but the community's not happy. That hurts. That hurts Goldeye. The community's right needs to be addressed. So, um, uh, but th that, that's the first challenge. So uh, when we went, uh, when I go in there and we're trying to drill, we're trying to make agreement, no one knows the, what we're talking about. We have to start at step one. And so the walking the path together approach was we started at step one. And we just, you know, talked. Uh, the other thing would be then uh, in that is capacity, and we've talked about capacity, a huge issue. And what does capacity mean and lack of capacity mean in Sandy Lake? Uh, on, there's capacity issues both for a junior and for the community. I'll, I'll for, uh, just talk about the community in this instance. Uh, no money uh, and no people uh, with the knowledge to properly negotiate. Uh, People, people are wonderful people, very smart, very intelligent, uh, but they don't know legal mining agreements. Why would they? So uh, um, um, a, a challenge is the community is really buying in, but they have no money to, uh, uh, there's no, 
there's no mineral development advisor there uh, and uh, that something like that would be really good it's just it's just there's so much resources needed and it's more than the community can do on its own it's more than gold I can do on its own and uh, Bernie Hughes um, uh, you know again I, it's not negative the government's starting to try you know we, I've seen what we're getting some government support for Sandy Lake but a hundred times more is needed, and you probably agree with that. Well, I won't put words in your mouth, but but uh, but it is uh, uh, um, a uh, um, the sort of thing where the the, the 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 challenge in terms of capacity is it's just a huge thing. So uh, somehow uh, it, a new a new model is needed. If the government wants Northern Ontario, if if the industry wants Northern Ontario to develop, if these opportunities are going to be real, um, uh, we we've got to push in the resources. Uh, you know, you can't push the resources in before you take them out, right? Uh, and uh, uh, because now you start drawing a sandy lake, uh, put a mine in there in one year. Uh, community is not going to benefit. They don't have the capability to benefit. Uh, they need to be able to benefit. Um, and, and they need the capacity to really, uh, they want to, and we're getting there, um, but capacity. So, Thank you very much. So we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges that your projects have faced, and we've heard, um, we've heard some of the same points that were made this morning around overlapping claims, lacking capacity, uh, Aboriginal title and competing uh, treaties, uh, pr permit approval delays, etc. Are there any um, uh, solutions that you'd like to exchange around any of these issues, that tips that maybe before we move on to talking about our internal processes? One of the things that uh, we've focused on is because as a very small company uh, with very limited resources, we've uh, identify potential partners and so we've worked very uh, effectively with um, education groups like Mining Matters which is a PDAC sponsored group that uh, gets information out to the youngest of the uh, students as well as to the to the community members themselves during summer programs that we've we've helped sponsor we also work with the arts groups and it's not about having them do mining related stuff it's about them inspiring kids to stay in school because we believe that our project timeline is going to encourage those kids to stay in school, to get educated, so that they can participate in our, in our project in the future. And that is, uh, uh, but we also know that we, we have a number of uh, community members uh, within the, the communities that uh, we're working with that don't have the skills or the education. So we've partnered with Confederation College and uh, uh, the Tribal Council to uh, provide a training platform for them to, first of all, upgrade to grade 12, secondly, to um, get a mining readiness uh, education, what mining is, and the last thing uh, that we're working on right now is a trades program. And the, the issue right now is that we have no permits to go forward to hire these people who are getting trades to get pre-apprenticeship programs that would allow them to work in a more substantive way because we don't want them just in entry-level jobs, we want them embedded throughout our organization as our mind progresses, or the project progresses, progresses. Those are some of the things that we've looked at and how we can manage the uh, capacity issue within the communities. You know, we've been consistent, I think that the biggest thing that we've been trying to do is consistent in our messaging with the communities. Uh, we try to minimize the expectation by being realistic with what we're promising and how we're going to develop our project. We've fallen short because we can't get the project moving forward and that means we can't get the permits uh, to, to do the work um, and that has limited us in what we can do but we do hire as many uh, of the local people when we get small little projects we just go to the communities we don't hire um, outside of the, the region if we can help it and so we've been very successful that way. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, we, we do promote a lot of training programs, and but I'll try and touch on some other areas as well. 
One of the things I think we've realized and been working on is, is trying to be creative about how we engage the communities. You know, there's the very formal consultation processes, you know, you have an EIS or an EA and, you know, you're doing an open house and you get in and you give a presentation and most people look at you like, what are you talking about? Um, so we work hard to, we have a number of community members, we're lucky that we, there's people who live close to our, our site. You know, there's people who work on our site, but we also bring people from communities onto our site. We had a really good day um, on the Cote Gold site. There's actually 37 registered archaeological sites. It's a really high number for a mining project in Ontario, according to our archaeologist. Um, and so we brought the elders and a number of community members out to one of the archaeological digs. It was active. Uh, they got to participate in the archaeological dig. Um, we had artifacts that were found right there the week before, visible, um, so they could actually see and understand some of the baseline studies and the effort we're putting into trying to characterize the area and understand how our project might uh, impact uh, the area and Aboriginal sites. And you know, hopefully that builds some trust in the community. Um, there is generally, you know, a distrust of mining companies. We're a big mining company, we're rolling in, they don't trust us, and so there's been a lot of effort to try and build that trust, um, but it does take time. We're also, you know, we, we encourage dialogue. We have an Aboriginal liaison person who works in the community. She spends, I think, three days a week in the community trying to figure out what are the concerns currently going on, uh, what information do you need from us. Uh, so there's a lot, we do put a lot of effort into being active in the community all of the time. Um, and and that pays dividends, I think, for us as well. So we are very open as a company. We have told all of our average communities, if you need us to come talk to you at any point in time, please just give us a call. We will be there. Uh, certainly we have certain milestones that we have to achieve with respect to the permitting process, um, but we're open to go above and beyond that at any point in time, and they're aware of that, um, and you know, we do take, they do take advantage of it from time to time. Steve. So I think um, you can go back to the slide before, actually. I'll get to that later. But uh, basically, the oh, sorry, I guess I can do that myself. But, <clears throat> so basically, this map and uh, the circumstances here that I just described, I think, speak to the importance of basically mapping the area where you plan to work before you really start investing a lot of money and understanding who all the various uh, parties are there. Uh, what their interests are, and then start to map out a strategy in terms of how you're going to uh, work with those different communities uh, successfully at the end of the day. Um, and then to kind of uh, address the, the uh, gold eye experience, um, um, I think that's that's a fascinating ca case history, and you, I really admire your persistence and sticking with it for for such a long time. It's really an incredible uh, case history and perseverance uh, through very difficult circumstances. But I think the, one of the lessons learned, and I've learned it myself in other areas, is that um, if you do the mapping of the landscape, that should include kind of doing an assessment on that community, the, the quality of the leadership in the community, and their willingness to, to see mineral exploration, mineral exploration development happen in their traditional territory. and. If they really don't want to participate, you might want to think about not investing in that area and investing somewhere else. That's just that's just being practical about it at the end of the day. In many cases, you um, you will face uh, a community where, uh, and this is true in Northern Ontario and in, in, in the Northwest Territories, uh, with leadership that just simply don't have any business experience and. Um, they may be involved in protracted negotiations with the government on various issues the community is facing. So their advisors are uh, lawyers, treaty rights lawyers, um, plus the um, process junkies and grievance experts, as, as Michael uh, <laughs> uh, characterized them earlier, um, that are not helpful in terms of entering into a business dialogue and coming up with a business solution. Uh, for the company that will allow you to move forward collaboratively. If you find yourself in that circumstance, then you've really got an uphill battle, um, and you may never get there. 
um, as you found, uh, it could take a very long time. You really have to ask yourself uh, whether it's worth it, whether there's enough value in that asset to make that kind of commitment with no certainty at the end of the day that that community really will ultimately enter into a form of agreement that works for them and works for the company. Thanks, Tom. Maybe I'll uh, address uh, one of your comments. I, I think any rational person, uh, it's not going to come out right, but uh, <laughs> any rational person would have walked away from WeBG Project a long time ago. <laughs> I, you know, not quite sure. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, but uh, what's what's really interesting is that I I think you know it's a fantastic it's a high grade gold project, and now that we've drilled it, and you're continuing it, the results are there, and for thir almost 26 years there were no results. It was just Blaine managed to hold on to it, right? Uh, but uh, but that that is the one of the problems. Uh, uh, a bit a business will not do that. It, it, it is not good for the investors. It is we managed to do it because we had other projects and, and it was, there was limited downside. We had extensions of time on the claims. We were able to hold on to it. Uh, but, but this lengthy, intensive effort is not a, a business model. Um, the approach Goldeye is taking by putting in all this effort, it's out of necessity. It's not out of, uh, it's not because it's uh, uh, um, uh, I guess I don't know the words, but it, it's uh, um, it's not sustainable, you know, for a junior company to do this. I'm the first to admit it. Uh, and, and we have a, uh, but we have a high grade project, and so it's the. I'm hoping it's the one in the million where where the the project will justify this effort. Uh, but you cannot take a greenfields project, and 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 say, okay, well, we're going to do what Goldeye's done and put three years of effort into uh, coming to an agreement, and then we'll drill. It's it's, so there's it's the mob. There's a huge problem with the model. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm glad about where gold I is. So uh, we've uh, been okay. But uh, just quickly to get back to the actual question, uh, uh, how do we overcome uh, the two issues we identified? No mining culture, no capacity. And it was simply uh, time and effort on the ground. Uh, as a junior company, we uh, by definition have zero money. You know. Uh, so uh, uh, we couldn't uh, afford the paying for consultants for the community and all that stuff. So they got uh, Sandy Lake First Nation got me, uh, and uh, they got Dave Jameson, fan, you know, greatest uh, project geologist and in, 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 uh, person to work with the community, right? So we were their technical experts, and. Uh, that that's not uh, sustainable either because they really need independent advice. But uh, that's you know we had good faith and that's that's we tried to uh, just work with them on it and uh, tried to build our own capacity till we get the project to a point where we can and the government can then actually uh, you know bring in the real experts. Maybe I'll just add to um, this, uh, Sheridan, just to speak to your comment and why you might want to persevere is, is uh, in a community like that where you think the, the quality of the asset would justify it is. Um, in many communities, there's rapid turnover in the leadership. Um, they have elections every two years. And if you get to know the community well enough and you know there's some other people that are interested in, in becoming part of the leadership, that maybe have a different view than the existing leadership, then that would give you a reason maybe to persist and uh, wait for um, new leadership to emerge in a community that's more amenable or easier to work with than doing business. Follow up. You know, and I'm going to speak as a, as a First Nation person, a former leader, but also someone who's been involved in the mineral industry since I was a teenager. I started work in the early 70s, and I worked in the early 70s in, in mining and exploration, not because it was something that was just thrust upon me, it's because I had a culture of miners that I followed. My father, my uncles, my grandfather, my brothers were all involved in the mining sector. How did we get there? Well, someone back in the uh, 1930s took a chance and said, I'm going to help this guy stake claims. My dad was a prospector. My dad was ended up becoming a miner and a tradesperson in the mine. All my brothers became tradespeople in, in uh, local mine. 
and went on to become something else uh, with their trades outside of the mining sector. Two of them stayed in it, uh, five older brothers. So it wasn't something that was, that was all of a sudden it thrust upon me, and I decided to become a, you know exploration specialist in geophysics or owning my own company. It was something that I, it became a culture that was just there. It, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to be on the land, but at the same time, make it a living for my family or earn a living so I could support my family. We have to inspire the communities to trust that this process will lead to greater prosperity because the question was, is it poverty reduction the government wants? Absolutely not, because if they would, they would, they, they would actually do something about it. If they're not doing anything about poverty reduction outside of reserves, why would they do it on reserves? So the challenge is the Indian Act has not allowed communities to prosper. It's, a, it's an act that suppresses, oppresses, and keeps them under the uh, authority of a foreign government, for lack of a better word. And so we need to, as First Nation people, we need to move away from that, and it's about having opportunities to build our own capacity, human resources, financial resources, so that we do not have to live under those uh, the Indian Act obligations. And that's how we're going to do it. Having projects in your backyard is the best opportunity for that advancement. My community now has, has agreements with mining companies, with exploration companies, we're into forestry, we're into hydroelectric, and we own real estate in, in uh, Timmins, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and other places as well. We own, uh, I can't remember how much of forestry lands we own uh, from um, I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, no, no, it's it's a, a patented lands. We we bought patented lands because we had the resources to do it, and that's that's building capacity. And not all of our members are explorers or miners. They're lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, teachers, social workers, because we created opportunities and expectations that we can do much more with our own intelligence and our own resources. Thank you for that. <laughs> I think we'll turn it over to some questions now. We're running out of time. Well, can we do 10 minutes? Uh, we're supposed to be finishing, but can we do 10 minutes of questions? <laughs> I brought my own cell phone. Yeah, okay. So let's do 10 minutes of questions. That would be, that would be great for the panel, please. Yeah, not being a rational person, I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> explain why. Uh, I worked with Inco through Lansdowne House, uh, Wanaman, all through that country, and quite often, you know, I, I was with Native people. And when I went to Sandy, I saw the same good people. Thank you for that. One, one question for Steve. Thanks. You, of, of the group here, you're the one that inherited consultation and relationships and engagement from a company that you acquired. Yes. How did that impact your approach or, or you know, moving what was there to what I Am Gold was looking for? That's a good question. I think we actually got lucky in, in many respects that Trelawney, the former owners of Trelawney, when Aspiration had laid down some of a good foundation uh, for us to, to follow on. So it was, a, I think, a relatively simple transition. Now, I think former owners of Trelawney had followed, had followed a path of, of building relationships in a way that can, can lead you to difficulties with respect to how you create expectations, the community, you could create expectations within the community of how money transfers or may transfer from a mining company to the community. So we've not necessarily followed that same path. We have said, you know, obviously with respect to broader agreements, we have a strong interest through our zero harm framework, which is applied across all our mines around the world, that our stakeholders benefit from from us being there in mining. So it's not just about our shareholders, it's about our stakeholders and the community members are stakeholders um, in that. And so all our agreements are built on what can we do to help the community 
And if it's business development they want, then that will be a focus for us. Um, if it's education, then we'll focus. And so we're, we're working with the individual communities to try and identify what are their needs um, through the process. Uh, and the consultation has been focused on that. And it's been, it's been a good experience, I think. But, yeah, we got lucky. We had a, there was a good first step, um, potentially to go down the wrong way, but we, uh, I think we took it over at the right time, probably. <laughs> Uh, Steve, just to build on what you were talking about, it, it's common for a, a junior mining explorer to eventually turn over their property to a whole different company uh, that can actually develop it. Uh, what's the possibility of a lack of trust with the, say, the Aboriginal communities dealing with the initial explorers knowing that those are probably not ultimately the people who will make the development decisions I mean that's a good question I I think I think for people in the junior situation that might have projects that would be taken over by a larger uh, mid-tier or larger company um, I think that to be honest you have to be open and transparent in those initial relationships saying you know this is what we do we expect that we may go it may with respect to us our involvement may go this far and then it'll be transferred to somebody else. Um, I think that's the only thing you really can do as from perspective of some company that might come in and take over a project obviously we're looking at what are those agreements that put in put in place early on so from additional information on the Cote mm -hmm. there was an expiration agreement in place it was a good one it wasn't too burdensome um, and I think that's the benefit of Wabin Tribal Council has a you know, a good history of dealing with mining in the area, and they had a, a very a procedure, a good procedure to work with mining companies. And so we inherited that, and it was a comfortable situation for us. Just had a question around, uh, if somebody could maybe comment on the strategies that you're using to communicate some of these challenges, especially around the need for resources and the time frames to the boards and to the shareholders. Well, I mean, I think I, meant, I maybe I mentioned that as being one of our internal challenges, so I'll just quickly speak to it. We actually had to give uh, an Aboriginal Engagement Consultation 101. Um, they just our board had not had a lot of experience. Uh, our origins of our company were in Africa, so you know they uh, original board members were the guys who were original boots on the ground in Mali uh, and had developed relationships with communities in Africa. But those communities function with respect to their rights. They're just much more like you would see a normal community here, not an Aboriginal community. Um, and so we we embarked on a an Aboriginal 101 course for our board members. Do you have timelines around those? For our Aboriginal 101 course, yeah. <laughs> it was. What did it take for them to get it? <laughs> <laughs> they did weren't they given it? much choice. Oh. It was here's your course. It's a crash course. And now let us go do our job. Um, and so far, they've they've been very supportive. Yeah. With with our board, we we have uh, annual um, courses that they they uh, participate in, and we do the same thing with our staff. What we did was um, we engaged some uh, Aboriginal leaders as advisors, such as uh, Chief Glenn Nolan. And uh, we brought an Aboriginal leader onto our board, and uh, a former national chief, Phil Fontaine. Um, I just add uh, Goldeye's perspective here. And one thing I might want to clarify: when I said our approach isn't sustainable, um, I meant that as, as in terms of the internal challenges, it's not sustainable. Not because it's not the right approach; it is what we should be doing, building the capacity. It's not sustainable because investors won't support it. Um, be at such an early stage. It's necessary, it's vital, but until you have the, the drilled off resource, investors aren't going to pay for community, uh, you know. Uh, so, so that's uh, why it's not sustainable. Um, not because uh, it, it should be sustainable, it should be a requirement. Um, and we're going to miss those opportunities in Ontario because the early exploration now requires this intensive consultation 
as it should. Uh, but Ontario is going to miss those opportunities unless we find a way to get the investors to understand that this is a part of early exploration. And uh, um, one way Gold I uh, did this is, uh, um, and, and it's very difficult, investors, to be clear about Northwestern Ontario, investors do not want to support exploration in Northwestern Ontario. That's difficult. We have a fantastic high-grade project, gold, high-grade gold, great. Investors, uh, you know, are worried about Ontario. Um, we went to, to an investment bank uh, yesterday. We had a meeting. I uh, asked the banker if I could bring a couple people. I said, yeah. So we went into the uh, investment bank uh, with uh, Deputy Chief uh, Robert Kakagamic, a GIS technician, Moodinius Fiddler, um, Lands and Resources Coordinator Wally Kakapedum, uh, Band Councillor Russell Kakagamic, uh, Deputy Chief of NAN Les Lutet, uh, <laughs> Elder from the Lands and Resources Team Sidney Fiddler, and Blaine, and me. And we said hello. And we said, we have no idea how this is going to work, but we'd like you two to meet each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not an existing Gould Eye investor. It was a pitch. This is dangerous. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm going to call them on Friday and see how it went. But, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's if, if we're talking about being a bridge, uh, inside the companies to understand it. Gold I can get away with this approach because it's such a small company. Uh, you know, the, uh, Blaine and I are able to, to take this approach because we don't have this, this massive bureaucracy that's against it. Uh, but the investors, uh, uh, investors have to understand the, the benefits. And, and, and when it comes down to dollars and cents, it can be applied that way too. The investors will do well by this approach. We have uh, another couple of minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought I would. Uh, I wanted to share an anecdote from the Canadian Aboriginal uh, Minerals Association meeting. I don't know how many people attended it. I know there were a few there. Um, how many people heard uh, Chief Shane Gottfordson speak in the context of the panel around uh, New Gold and their agreement? Because um, well, his message was very refreshing, and it's a message that I've been delivering, and it was, I was delighted to hear it from a highly respected, successful uh, Aboriginal leader like Chief Gottfordson, who's the uh, chief of the Tukamuks First Nation. And their agreement with New Gold around the New Afton mine is, uh, was a precedent-setting agreement. We celebrated at PDAC a few years ago. You'll remember Glenn and uh, Wesley during the Aboriginal Forum. So he was asked a couple of questions. Um, one was, um, uh, what was the secret to the success they had in negotiating this, this really important precedent-setting agreement with New Gold? And he said the secret was, we didn't have a lawyer on our negotiating team. <laughs> it was just beautiful. <laughs> and then, then there was a later question where he, he was asked, so what were the challenges that you faced during the negotiation? They said the biggest challenge we faced was New Gold had a lawyer on their negotiating team, <laughs> and she's almost screwed everything up. <laughs> He's a pretty frank and candid individual, and, and uh, it was great to hear that because that is very often the case. I know there are many people in the room here that have, uh, have been negotiating agreements with uh, First Nations in good faith and have been frustrated because the, the advisors, the legal counsel, the First Nation have, have not been working in the best interests of both parties to actually enter into a business agreement. And in our experience in Northwest Territories, we did everything right, and we negotiated a lot of agreements. And the one success, or one uh, First Nation where we did not have success was where there was a lawyer there that was determined to see failure in that agreement. And uh, so that's an important takeaway I want to leave with everyone is, is um, the, the quality of those advisors are really important. And, and we'll give you uh, the names of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. Uh, I think that was very, very interesting for the, uh, for the audience. And I believe we're out of time. So are there any closing remarks from, from TGDG? Great.
I'm going to go through the thank yous, so if you'd hold your applause to the end. First, I want to thank Bill McGinty and Sheridan, Sheridan Barnett for putting together a great agenda and a, a great roster of speakers. It's because of their first-hand knowledge of what's going on in the mineral industry with respect to Aboriginal rights and issues that they brought together such an illustrious and informed group of speakers. Second, I'd like to thank our presenters and our panel for their comprehensive presentations. I respect your dedication and commitment to your projects and your communities. Third, thanks to the TGDG committee for putting together yet another logistically perfect <laughs> symposium. Um, not only to, the, to those of you who are here, but to the, the uh, community on the web. And finally, thank you all of, all of you for attending. We hope you take away something from this afternoon's session. The exploration community's engagement with First Nations should be sincere and interactive. As we all know, these are challenging issues for the industry and not just for the exploration and mining business. But we have seen some positive examples of success today by continuing to have, on by continuing to have ongoing and meaningful dialogues. We will hopefully continue to see mutually beneficial agreements in the future. Please pass the word on that exploration the exploration community's engagement with First Nations is infectious and hopefully contagious. But done well and with sincerity, it will never be fatal. <laughs> with that, I invite you to continue discussions in the room adjacent where snacks have been set up for us. And I hope you all got your drink tickets when you came in. Uh, the TGDG committee looks forward to seeing you at the next event on December 9th. Roger Wallace and William Kerr's talk on facts and fallacies a personal commentary on the last 45 years of uranium exploration and development in the Athabasca Basin north of Saskatchewan, after which we will follow with a Christmas networking section. Bill McGinty would like to have a couple more words and then a round of applause for everybody. Okay, applaud them all now because I don't have anything saying. <laughs>